We're in the Gospel of Mark. We're in fact, we're in chapter 34. I'm, I'm sorry. Remember I told you it's, it's been a long week. We're in chapter 4. There, are, there is not 34 chapters in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we are in chapter 4. We'll go up to verse 34 today. The chapter 4 has been teaching us so much about the spreading of the Gospel and the Word of God. Okay, we've learned how important our hearts are, our personal hearts are, for the gospel to grow. Um, things that affect our, the word is our hearts. The word is referred to in the, in the previous parable as, as uh, the seed, and, and the soil makes a difference on what and if and how the the soil produces the heart produces the the seed is the word and and so we've learned that our hearts make a huge difference the word can be given to us but what our hearts do with it uh, makes a big difference within our lives Jesus has begun teaching in parables and we've we've learned that that those who are able to understand the parables are those who are close to Jesus those who want to grow in him and learn of him and therefore they ask questions they inquire they come up next to him and and they inquire of him um parables can either draw you in closer to the lord to where you're inquiring of him or they can push you away because you don't understand them and you just forget you know what it's it's over my head, or I don't know, or I ain't got time for this, or whatever the case may be. Jesus often would teach in parables. Today in our text, we're going to be going through a couple more t uh, parables. Uh, the first one deals with spiritual growth, and prayerfully you've noticed that as Jesus has begun his ministry, one of his emphasis is a relationship with God not just going to church and not just saying, yes, I, I believe in Jesus, but, but a relationship, a drawing close, listening, asking, talking, living with Christ and inquiring of Christ. And there's, there is a, a, a walk, an involvement that must take place in our lives to grow in our relationship with the Lord, just like in any relationship. You can't have any relationship with your kids, your husbands, your wives, your neighbors, if you're not involved, if you're not inquiring, if you're not you know, stepping into it and, and getting involved. Sometimes that can be difficult, sometimes you know, it can be hard, but it's that involvement that develops and makes a relationship. God uses difficult times to to strengthen us and to make us closer and draw us closer to Him. So parables are meant to draw us in. Parables are meant to cause us to ask questions, to look deeper, to, to grab a hold of what God is sharing with us. And if we refuse to do that, then we're not going to grow. Our, our heart will not produce uh, the fruit that is necessary. Again, in our text today, the first parable that he shares addresses spiritual growth. Let's read the first part of our text. Mark 4, beginning in verse 26. It says, And he, referring to Jesus, And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night, and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Father, as we open your word, it is our desire again, Father, to learn of you and to grow in you and to understand you. Father, your passion is to bless us and to make us happy in our relationship walking with you, Lord. And, and so as we open your word together today, Father, may we look to you for understanding. May we desire, Lord, 
to grow. And may we surrender all, Father. If there's anything in the way within our lives, may it, it be cast aside today, Lord. May we have that, that, that desire to learn and to grow of you and our relationship with you. So bless this time as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. First, let's look at the natural growth process of a seed, and then we'll, we'll jump into the spiritual meaning. He shares with us here that once the seed is sown, um, uh, it, it, it takes time to grow. It's not an immediate thing. Uh, once a seed is put in the ground, it's not like you stood there and watch it grow. It, it takes time. It, it takes water. Um, you know, if you've ever, you know, I, I remember in school they would get the little egg cartons, remember, and cut them and put a little dirt and a little seed in there and, and, uh, and then send it home with the kids. And, and every day they're looking and, and looking and, and looking and they're expecting the plant to be there eat, even the first morning. Okay, but we try to teach them it takes time. It, it's not immediate. And, and it teaches the kids about growth, yes. And it teaches kids about nature, yes. And it teaches kids about plants, yeah. But it also teaches them patience, that you have to wait. And it, and it teaches them that they have to do something. They have to water it every day. So it teaches them responsibility. Okay, and, and so this is what... You know, we learn here that, that when you plant a seed, it, it's not an immediate growth. The scripture says, sleep by night and rise by day. This is referring to a day-by-day -day growing process. The growth of the plant is not seen immediately. It takes a little bit of time, and you look for that little growth. Things have begun once you plant the seed. The germinating process has begun but it's not visible to us. We don't see what's happening under the ground with that seed. But it, it's begun, but we just can't see anything yet. But sleep by night and rise by day, day by day, in time we will see the growth. The scripture also says that first the blade, then the head, and then the full grain, letting us know that there is a time process that is specific in order. It, it, it has a time process. It, it does particular things, but there is an order to it. Okay, it's not, it doesn't produce fruit first. It has to do all the other processes before it ever gets to the fruit. The scripture also says the process of growing is not under, understood, but it sure. We know that if you put it in the ground, something will come. We don't understand how all that works. Our text says he himself does not know how, meaning the farmer can't explain how. They just know the process. They just know that, that you plant the seed, then you wait, and first you'll see the blade, and then you'll see the head, and then you'll see the full grain, and then you, ha you can harvest it. They don't know all the processes, and he can't, they don't know how all this unfolds, but they know it's going to, it's sure, and they know that there is a process for it to do so. Then our text says, for the earth yields crops by itself, meaning it's not the farmer who produces the crop, it's the earth who does it. The farmer just plants the seed. The growth is sure, you can't stop the natural growth unless the soil is not receptive to the, to the seed, but once the seed is sown, the earth does what the earth does, and it produces. And then once the grain is fully grown, it's time to harvest. It's time to enjoy what the seed has produced. So now let's look at the spiritual meaning of this parable. Jesus is teaching us that this is how the Word of God grows in our lives. This is how our spiritual lives grow. Remember we learned in the parable of the sower that the seed is the Word of God. The seed is the Bible. The day-by-day -day process lets us know that the growth of our relationship with the Lord, it takes time. You, you, you can't be here until you go through a process. We, we don't fully mature, you know, my, my grandson wants to do things that adults do. He can't. 
Okay, he's not there yet. He will, but there's a process that he must go through to get there. And this is what the parable is teaching us, that there is a process in our relationship with God. Yes, it begins with the sowing of the seed. And as time goes by, changes in our life come. First, again, we accept the Lord into our life because we believe his word. And then we begin to grow as we learn about the Lord and, and his way of life because his way of life is different than our way of life. So we, we began to grow. Okay, I understand. Okay, I can see this. We then begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And then the fruit of the Spirit is harvested and given for others to enjoy. But there is a process, is what Jesus is teaching us here, that you're not going to just accept the Lord and bam, everything is now what you want it to be. You know, it, it takes patience. Jeanette recently planted some pumpkins for our grandsons, and like every day, you know, it's like, where's the pumpkin? Where's the pumpkin? Where's the pumpkin? And then we had some green leaves blow. So we look at look, look, this growing, and he looks at it like, I ain't a pumpkin. Where's the pumpkin? You know, he doesn't care about the green leaves. He doesn't care about the stem. We planted pumpkins. I want to see a pumpkin. Okay, and so we, we were explaining to him, it'll come. Uh, we didn't do good, and we killed all of them, but, but he never did get to see his pumpkins. <laughs> but but it, it takes time. But then fruit does come. I want you to know and understand, this is so important. Please know and memorize the fruit that the Bible speaks of, the fruit of God in our lives. It is listed for us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is what God is desiring to produce in our lives. This is what the Word of God produces in our lives. The Word of God is not read just so that you can memorize it. Memorize it, great, but that's not the purpose of the Word of God. The purpose of the Word of God is to produce this fruit, to produce love, to produce joy, to produce peace, to produce goodness and faithfulness and self-control. That's what the Word is to produce within our lives. So we can memorize all we want, but if we're not allowing it to produce, it doesn't really serve its purpose. It's there to produce fruit. And we do, not, we do not always know how this growth is done, but we know it's sure. I don't know how God produces love in an angry heart, but the Word of God does. I don't know how the Word of, of God produces you know, the, the willingness to, to have self-control and to tell myself no, but it does. You know, I don't know how it produces these fruits, but I'm sure that it does because I've seen it produced. It is not us who produce this spiritual fruit in our lives. It is the Lord who produces through the power of God working in our hearts through his word. So if you're trying to conjure up that love, if you're trying to conjure up that self-control, if you're trying to be the one that's going to beat yourself into the submission to the Word of God, good luck. Okay, because we don't have that ability. That ability is in the hand of God. It is in His hand that produces these things. Just like everything is in the seed that is necessary to produce the fruit that comes. If you, if you plant a, a seed for a, an orange tree, everything to produce that orange tree is in that seed. Everything. That little seed holds all of the information and abilities once it's put into the ground for the ground to work with it to produce an orange tree. And so just as everything is in the seed, so everything is in the word that is necessary to produce the spiritual fruit in our lives. It's all here in the Word, you guys. It's all here. He left nothing out. Everything for our spiritual growth is in the Bible. Everything for us to be able to produce the fruit described in Galatians 5 is in the Bible. It's there. It's ready to roll. It's ready to go. Our spiritual growth 
depends on the Word of God that is planted in our hearts. So wouldn't that mean that the more Word that is planted in our hearts, the more fruit is produced? But that also means if there is very little Word planted in our heart, then there's very little fruit. There's no growth. We can own six Bibles. We can have them in all the rooms of our house. And we can even have some scriptures memorized. But if that word is not planted in our hearts, it does not produce the fruit. We have to read God's word. Please understand, we are not responsible to make the word grow and produce in our lives, but we are responsible to sow the word into our hearts. I can't make God's word do anything, but I can put it into my heart. That's the sowing. That's what we're responsible. We're the sowers. We're the ones casting out and sowing the seeds. The seeds is the word of God. The earth, the soil is our heart. And God does that work. And so Jesus is teaching us that a relationship with him means that we are involved, that we are taking place, that we are reading, that we are watering, that we are taking care of it. I've shared with you guys before that Jeanette and I are not good at growing plants. Okay, But I also know the reason we're not is because we don't take the time to pay attention to them. Okay? We have a lot of fake plants in our house. We do okay with the fake plants. Um, we have killed fake plants, okay? Um, but it takes effort, it takes involvement, it takes, you know, when we first planted the pumpkins, I was Mr. Get It Done every day out there checking on it, watering it, and, and then it kind of faded away. And as I faded away from taking care of it, it faded away from life. Now, don't tell my grandsons it's my fault, okay? <laughs> but our relationship with God, He does the work. Don't misunderstand me. He does and produces the fruit, but He's given us the Word and said, put this in your heart. Plant this deep. All of it. A bunch of it. Don't just put a seed in there. Put a you want all of this fruit, all of the variations of fruit. You want all of the trees growing. You want all of the fruit that is accessible and given to us through the Word of God. So the parable teaches us. It takes time. Okay, if, if there is a habit in your life, it probably won't disappear tomorrow. But if you pray about it and read the Word about it and learn about it and, and learn to say no to it, then you will see the self-control from the Spirit of God unfolding. You'll see the love begin to grow. You'll see the joy blossom within your life. But you have to be attentive to it. Jesus then shares another parable with us. Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verse 30. Then he, again Jesus, said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all of the seeds on earth. But when it grows, it grows up and becomes greater than all of the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may, rest, may nest under its shade. There are two interpretations generally considered for this parable, and they are radically different. Both interpretations believe that this is describing that the church will start small, which it did. It began in a home, and it began in Jerusalem, and it then spread uh, to Samaria and, and every place, to all of the world. So that is a, an accepted interpretation, if you will, of this parable, that the church started small and then grew and do a great work. But then the interpretations go in totally different directions. 
One interpretation teaches that the church began small but has grown into a large body of believers that has spread all over the world. They teach that the birds are the people, the Christians, being added to the church daily and that the church is providing a covering and a protection for them. The, the branches are, are protecting and so we, we come to church to be protected. We, we come to church to be covered. But there are a few problems with this interpretation which leads us to the other interpretation. If you remember in the parable of the sower that we went in the beginning of, of Mark chapter 4, Jesus taught that the birds were Satan who comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in our hearts. So he's described in the parables that the, the birds are evil. Okay, so the way parables work, you have to keep the same meaning. If you don't, if you keep changing the meaning around, then parables are useless because we'll never under, we get to interpret what it means. I say the bird this time is this. Well, I say the bird is this. So the birds in the scriptures refers to evil. Okay, so in this parable, wouldn't the birds also then need to be interpreted as evil? Also, our text says that the birds nest under the shade. King James Version has a better translation. It says under the shadow of the branches, under the darkness, if you will, under, the, under what deflects the light, keeps the light away, the shadows. Now, 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, says this is the measure with this is a measure which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with, with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ, of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There are no shadows in the church, nor, are there, nor should the church ever provide shadows to nest in. God is light. And we went through this in other parts of the Gospel of Mark, that we are the light of the world. We are, we are to provide light for others to see, to put a light on things. We don't provide shadows. We don't provide coverings and places to hide. So he is sharing with us there that this is referring to the birds which would be evil and their shadows in the church. Also, the Gospel of Matthew says that the mustard seed grows into a tree. Look at Matthew 13, beginning in verse 31. Same parable, but he adds that it's a tree. Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it, when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Mustard seeds grow into large bushes but they do not grow into trees. Okay, so, so this is describing an unnatural growth that becomes a tree. It, it's, yes, they are large bushes, but they are not trees. And so I believe this parable is warning that the church will grow into an unspiritual church that will have evil people hiding inside of it. And even at times, evil people running the church. This is Jesus teaching and letting us know that, yeah, the, the fruit is necessary and, and the seeds are necessary, but warning us as far as, listen, listen, his church will be put into the hands of people and we do not have a good reputation for being holy. People have a, relation, a, 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 um, a reputation of selfishness and evil and, and different things. So I believe 
he is teaching that we have to be aware and, and watch the church and watch what's unfolding. Listen to what Jesus shares with the church of Laodicea in, in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. He says, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because, I, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eyes that, that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chase and therefore be zealous and repent he says behold I stand at the door and I knock and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me He's knocking on the door of the church, folks. This is what he's saying there. And he's saying, here's their opinion of themselves. We're rich and we're wealthy and we have need of nothing. And he says, and, and you don't even know the truth. You're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You don't see the truth. You have hid yourself and covered yourself and deceived yourself. And so I believe that Jesus is is warning us as Christians and as a church that we must, we must stick to the Word of God. We have to have the Word of God in our lives and in our hearts. If the Word is not there, then we're left to our opinions and ideas and thoughts and feelings and emotions. And I don't know about you, but my feelings and emotions and thoughts can get pretty crazy. And, and, and it's really easy for me to find people who do not have the same emotions and thoughts and opinions. And now we have a problem because we're not in agreement. And then we get bring a third person in and a fourth person in, and, and you can see that it can just cause nothing but chaos. We have to have the Word of God in our hearts. That's what we stand on. That's what produces. That's what we seek. That's what we learn from. That's what enables us to grow. It's nothing else. It's the Word of God. It's the seed that is planted when we believe that needs to grow and produce. Jesus will teach us only as much as we're able to handle, which I try to do on Sunday. So two more verses and we'll be done. Verse 33, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. It says he spoke, spoke the word to them as they were able to hear, meaning he understood that we can get overwhelmed when we are taught too much. Some people can take in more than others. But there is a point to where it's just like too much. And you just, you shut off. You just turn off and it's like all you hear, blah, 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 because you're done. Winston Churchill said, the head cannot take in more than the seat can endure. Meaning, you know, when we're fidgety or not that you guys are fidgety, not that you guys fall asleep or when we fall asleep. It means that it's too much. And so Jesus understood that. And so it says there that he continued to teach in parables and he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. Have you ever, let's call it a discussion, not an argument. Have you ever been in a discussion with somebody and perhaps the tempers are a little high, okay? You should at that point realize 
we're not, a point, we're not at a point of listening. We're at a point of proving my point. We're at a point of being right. We're at a point of, of uh, interrupting because you're wrong, I'm right. You need to be quiet so that I can talk. And it's, it's a time that you can't get things discussed. You can't learn. You can't grow. The Lord has understanding that we cannot just sit and, and, and constantly learn, but we have to set those opportunities aside in our lives to learn. Don't ignore those opportunities. Don't fill those opportunities with other things in life. We have to make time to read God's Word and to understand God's Word and to ask questions of God's Word. I have, please don't misunderstand me, I've said this numerous times, I have nothing against the one-year Bible. Okay, anybody here going through the one-year Bible, God bless you. Okay, and, and I've known of people who've told me I'm going to go through the one-year Bible twice this year. God bless you. Okay, but it's not the amount that we read, it's what we learn that makes the difference. I would prefer you to read two verses a day and learn than to read five chapters a day. If you can read five chapters a day and grow from those five chapters, read all five. Okay, don't cut yourself short. Don't limit yourself. Well, the pastor said I only have to read two verses today. Good, okay. If you, you need, we need to make time to learn, to grow, to understand. Anybody who gets an A in school has put time to reading and studying. Okay, it's not that they're smarter than us. It's just that they've put the effort to grow. They've taken the time to learn. They've taken the time to check things out. If we did the same, we could learn too. But it's not because they're smart and I'm dumb. It's because they put themselves into it. So we have to make those opportunities so that we are able to hear what God says with, shares with us. You know your schedules. You know who you are. Some people like to get up early in the morning and do their devotions and growing. Some people like to take time in the afternoon and, and after lunch or, or during lunch take the time to grow. Some people like to do it in the evening time before they come to bed. There is no set time that you must do it. We just have to do it. You know your life, you know your, who you are, you know your schedule, you know your habits, you know when you're, you're capable of learning the most. Some people figure, well, the Bible says that early in the morning we rise. Jesus was always getting up early in the morning, so I gotta get up early in the morning. And so they're so sleepy and tired, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew, wait a <laughs> and then they, oh, now I gotta get ready for work, and then they're driving to work, and it's like, what did I read? What, what, what did I? So mornings don't work. That's fine. It, it doesn't mean that God's going, well, then fine. If you're not going to read in the morning and start your day with me, then I'm just not going to spend time with you today. We know when we learn best. So take that time. Even if it's right in the middle of the most exciting game ever. Take the time to learn. If, if, if this time is your learning time, take the time to learn. That's what Jesus is encouraging us. But it also says that Jesus continued to teach through parables. Why? Because a parable will either draw us in closer or push us away. So those, the Lord wants us to want to learn. He wants us to want to understand. And so he shares a parable so that we can scratch our head and go, what? What does that mean? Explain this to me, Lord. And then we have to get into the Bible and, and look up the word birds and realize, wow, every time it mentions birds, except for in creation, uh, they have issues. You know, but we need to learn these things. We can't, because you got to admit that this parable sounds pretty cool that, you know, starts small and grows into a big church. We live in the time and the age that there are mega churches everywhere. And so it's like, yeah, we're totally seeing this fulfilled and hiding under the branches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we start thinking about it. What are we doing hiding in church? 
What are we doing under the branches? What are we doing in the shadows of things? What are we doing in, in, in secret places? That's not biblical. So that's how we study and know. And that's why he gives us parables, so that we'll take the time to grow and search and ask. Again, our spiritual growth is like a plant. It takes time to grow. And it comes in phases. And though we may not understand how the growth is accomplished, we are sure, we are sure that the growth will come. And as time goes by, changes in our life come. First again, we, we accept the Lord into our lives because we believe his word. I believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ and died for my sins. And then we begin to grow as we learn about the Lord and his way of life. And then we begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And then we share this fruit with others. It's just like somebody watching you eating a really delicious apple and they just say, do you have another one? It looks good. It looks enticing. It, 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 you know, and you're smacking your lips and juice is running all over and they can tell you're really enjoying that apple. Do you have another one? That's what the fruit of the Spirit, as it comes out of our lives, other people see it and they say, that looks really good. Do you have more? And we share with others the fruit that has been growing in our lives. And please understand, it is not us who produces the spiritual fruit in our lives. It is the Lord who produces through the power of God working in our hearts through His Word. And just like everything is in the seed that is necessary to produce the fruit, everything is in the Word that is necessary to produce the spiritual fruit in our lives. Our spiritual growth, again, depends on the Word of God that is planted in our hearts. We are not responsible to make the Word grow and produce fruit in our lives, but we are responsible to sow the Word of God into our hearts. And so remember, our faith starts small. When we first accept the Lord, it's small, but it grows. But he warns us, but be careful, because the enemy does not leave us alone. Oh, great, they're Christian now. i got to walk away from them, leave them alone. Oh, no, not at all. Be careful, because the enemy does not leave us alone. He will try to come in and hide in the shadows of our lives. So let no shadows in our lives. Let your light shine for the Lord, exposing everything. I know there's things that we would really not like to have exposed. Then get rid of them. Okay? If you know they shouldn't and you don't want them exposed, don't hide them. Get rid of them through the power and the strength and the abilities of God. That's what we have to be careful of. We have to be careful that we're not looking for the shadows in the church that we can hide under. We need the light on. We need to just expose everything God will expose. He'll shine his light on our lives. And then what do we do with it? Do we hide it? Or do we say thank you and we get rid of it? Prayerfully, we say thank you and we get rid of it. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together today and allowing us, Lord, to open your word. Father, what a joy. What a joy to walk in your grace. Lord, as trials and situations and circumstances and fears and all these things come against us, Lord, you stand there in your strength protecting us. Lord, you have given us your word and you have promised that planting your word into our hearts will produce fruit and we will grow. May we take your word daily and put it into our hearts and allow it to produce and to grow, and that as we are participating and, and enjoying the fruit, that we will then have the opportunities of sharing the fruit with others. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercies and your grace. And we pray, Father, that as we close in worship, that you will embrace our praises and that we will worship you for who you are. Lord, we do pray that your anointing would be upon our offering, Lord, as we give it unto you. And we pray, Lord, 
that as we worship, our hearts will be prepared as we partake in communion because it is through the sacrifice and the suffering of Jesus that we have this amazing life in Christ, able to come into your presence and worship and adore you. So bless this time as we, as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.